This episode is brought to you by Understood.org, a nonprofit dedicated to helping people who learn and think differently thrive. When my kid was little and he would be doing like Zoom or Google Meet with, with the grandparents and he would just walk away. That's cute when you're three, but when you're seven, when you're 10, you got to say goodbye. Like, have a nice day. You can't just like walk away. But we need to teach kids that. And if they don't see it enough, that's, they're not getting the modeling. Figuring out the best way to guide kids through the digital world is complicated. What should parents consider when setting boundaries? What benefits are there in the online world for neurodivergent kids? And what do kids and parents need to know about the implications of growing up in public? Today's guest is Devorah Heitner. Devorah is the author of ScreenWise, Helping Kids Thrive and Survive in Their Digital World, and the forthcoming book, Growing Up in Public. And she's going to help us answer these questions. That's straight ahead on episode 158. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. If you have a kiddo who is really struggling with anxiety or obsessive and compulsive thoughts, the Neurodiversity Alliance is opening up a new offering for parents. We are going to start offering parent support through Dr. Ellie Leibowitz's SPACE program. Dr. Leibowitz, if you remember, was on the podcast on episode 88. So if you want to hear more directly from him about the program, you should check it out. And this is kind of a big piece of news. We are hosting an informational webinar to talk about the program on February 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern. The program is entirely virtual, so you can join from wherever you're located. It's very easy to register for the webinar. You can find the link just right there in the show notes on your app, on the website, and in our weekly newsletter. My conversation with Devorah Heitner is up next. When I found the Neurodiversity Podcast, I was really kind of desperate to learn about myself and understand myself. And understand my kids. And honestly, I wanted to find like a tribe who I could relate to and feel like I fit in. This podcast brings on guests who seem to be moving neurodiversity more into the mainstream. And Emily Kircher Morris is amazing. I feel like she's talking straight to me sometimes. Her knowledge about people who think differently is so refreshing. Everyone's different. And the world needs to understand them. And that's what the Neurodiversity Podcast is doing. Helping them understand us. 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 Today, we're talking to Devorah Heitner, author of ScreenWise, Helping Kids Thrive and Survive in Their Digital World, and the forthcoming book, Growing Up in Public. Devorah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Oh, I'm so excited to chat with you. So there are a lot of things that are really hard about parenting these days, but I think keeping up with the changes in media and technology is really probably one of the hardest areas to manage because it's just really difficult to monitor things change really quickly and frequently. I don't know, as a parent, it's like sometimes I feel like I have a grip on something and then then there's something new that comes up and I have to try to figure out how to handle that as well. There's a seven-year age gap between my oldest and youngest children. And even the considerations now that we have to make for our youngest are not the same. So I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, as you've kind of watched this and worked with this and seen some of these things evolve, What are some of the big shifts in media and technology um, that are influencing how our kids use tech? Well, I think one of the big shifts is that it's more visual. So even little kids can do it. Like a tablet is so accessible even to a kid who's preliterate, for example, because it's so picture-based and just swiping. And you see kids even try to like swipe a magazine where they're like, hey, (laughs) it should work the way my iPad works, right? Um, So that's interesting. And then I think another shift is the sort of just ubiquity. Like most families have a ton of advice, you know, devices around and um, Wi-Fi is almost, you know, universally in like every public space. Uh, So those are some shifts. And even I would say that the differences between your, you know, the the seven years, it's like I, I had students who I taught 
in when I taught college who were freshmen and sophomores, so they're 18, 19, 20 years old. And I would have them go interview third graders in the local elementary school to do a media ethnography of those third graders. And they were always like, oh, I can't believe the games they play or the things that they're seeing. So and those kids could have been their siblings. Yeah. So I think even every eight to 10 years. Right. So like, for example, your older kids didn't grow up with TikTok. And now little kids like our TikTok is as ubiquitous as YouTube was for the older kids. How do you think that that is influencing how we as parents kind of handle it? It just always feels very overwhelming. Uh, But that's me personally. I don't know if other parents feel that way or... I think we don't need to get like a master's degree in every app as much as we want to think about how, first of all, which apps are our kids actually interested in. So you don't need to learn about every app. You need to know about the ones your kids want or are using or their friends are using. And then you want to understand what they're doing with it. Like, who are they hanging out with? If they're in Minecraft, are they using it solo? Are they playing with their siblings? Who are they playing with? Are they, if they're in a suite of games called Roblox, that a lot of kids is like a kind of a gateway to cloud-based gaming for, for very young kids in some cases, you know, again, how are they interacting with people? Are they playing with strangers? Are they playing with kids they know? I would really look at who they're with in any of these spaces and who they're following. So it's hard to say, for example, when parents say, is, you know, Instagram or Pinterest or Snapchat or any particular app, good or bad, because it really depends what you're looking at. There are sort of negative experiences to be had in any space. If you play Minecraft with the wrong people, it's going to be a very negative experience potentially, but it can be a great place to be. And so it's not the app itself, but kind of who you're with, what your experience is like, if, and anything we can do to mentor our kids in these different apps with a mind to who they are and maybe what their unique brains also might make extra challenging or extra rewarding about these spaces is going to make it how is going to be helpful to set them up for successful experiences. Tell me a little bit more about mentoring. How would you describe what that really means? I know you were just talking about how we are monitoring who they're kind of with as their friends, but what other aspects go into that? So, I mean, mentoring kids in the digital age is being curious about what they're doing, having open-ended conversations like, oh, you're interested in being on a group text? Okay, well, what, what are you going to do if everyone starts talking in a negative way about another kid on that group text? Like, let's think about what are some options. So mentoring is kind of guiding kids to some of the challenges they might experience and even helping them think them through. Also sharing some of the challenges you've experienced, like, oh, wow, someone got really mad at work and emailed everyone and then it really blew up. And, you know, they had to then walk around and kind of talk to people in person because, of course, when we get really upset in the digital in- interaction, it can be really helpful to talk in person to work it out. Yeah. Talking with kids about some things that might be likely, I'm going to say like almost guaranteed to come up in their experience, like in group texting, helping them again, think through like, what would you do if, um, and then when they do make mistakes, which again is inevitable, working with them to troubleshoot, like, how are you going to move forward from this make mistake? What's your plan here? It's hard to figure out exactly what's always going on. You know, I've got one kiddo who is totally involved in Roblox. I've got another one who leans towards like Snapchat and and TikTok, although I think we took TikTok off his phone because it was becoming a bit of an obsession. And I don't know what's going on with my kids and their friends when they're at school, all the information, unless they disclose that to me. And so I think the difference obviously is I don't always know who the people are that they're talking to on their devices because it could be anybody. It's very different than when we had a house phone growing up and people to call and ask for us and get through the sort of our parents. We also knew who was calling them, right? And now we're thumbing out a lot of our social lives on our own phones and our kids aren't really witnesses to that and understanding that. And it takes away an opportunity to teach them unless we say out loud, oh, I'm going to call grandma now because she's texting me, but I don't really understand what she wants. Or this is big news, so I have to call the person. It's kind of not news for texting. Like, we may need to do more of that talking through because otherwise kids aren't picking it up via osmosis. Like I knew when my mom wanted to get off the phone with someone because her voice would change on the call. And so some of those cues our kids aren't getting. So they don't know, like they'll be Zoom. Like when my kid was little and he would be doing like Zoom or Google Meet with with the grandparents and he would just walk away. That's cute when you're three, but when you're seven, when you're 10, you got to say goodbye. Like have a nice day. You can't just like walk away. But we need to teach kids that. And if they don't see it enough, that's they're not getting the modeling. And we know, especially when kids are neurodiverse, they may need more explicit instructions on some of these social things than we might think. But no kids, I would say, no matter how typical or how neurodiverse they might be, um, no kids are getting the explicit teaching about the phone that we got because so much of that was just hearing our parents on their calls, hearing our older siblings. Like if you 
had an older sibling and you were thinking about how to ask somebody out on a date, like maybe you'd actually like eavesdropped on your sibling doing that before you got there. So you had some clue about like how it goes. And our kids are just watching our thumbs. They have no idea what we're doing. And they are reading our text. That's kind of invasive, but there may be some middle ground and their privacy. Similarly, like I, I don't believe that we should necessarily be like reading 100 percent of our kids texts, for example, or monitoring them to that degree. But when my kid is struggling with something um, like struggling to make a plan that works with friends, for example, and really having our time, I may say, hey, can I see the texts? OK, I noticed that there's no time in this thread. So I'm going to suggest that you throw out a time and see if it works for everyone, because I think that's how come you're having trouble like navigating, getting everyone together to play Dungeons and Dragons is that there's no times being mentioned. You're saying, how about Sunday? And I think you need to say, like, how about Sunday at two? And that will help people say, like, yes or no, or yes to Sunday, but no to two or whatever it is. Um, And seeing that text is helping. But I'm not just like invasively just grabbing and I'm asking, like, hey, is it okay if I look at this? I think, you know, I could be helpful here. I'm also not getting in the text thread and texting everyone, you know, because I need him to learn how to do this independently and to make plans. But I would say the middle school, even early high school years are all, especially with the pandemic and some of the sort of interruptions in our kids' lives, they may need extra support on learning how to check in with friends, make plans, be responsive, et cetera, even if they are doing a pretty good job managing their social lives on tech. We always have to remember what types of explicit instructions sometimes kids need. And I think that we forget that a lot of times. As an advocate for neurodivergent kids, we also can recognize that technology might really have a lot of different values for people who learn and think differently, just even beyond relying on the assistive technology, which can be extremely useful for people who need it. I know a lot of neurodivergent kids might prefer relationships and communication that are based in virtual worlds or texting or whatever that might be. What are some factors that might come into play that can help influence or or help parents judge what types of media is appropriate or or useful um, based on a child's unique needs? Yeah, I would say you want to observe how your child is when they're using a particular app and afterwards. Like if you see a tremendous mood crash, I mean, a lot of kids will be crabby after they game, for example, because the transitions are rough. But if they can recover from that, you know, and move into another activity in a certain amount of time, then maybe that activity is fine. If you have a kid who really is struggling with those transitions, and having like massive meltdowns after gaming, for example, then you may have a kid who can't game during the school week, or you may have a kid who actually, you know, we maybe you need a visual schedule. Maybe this is something you work on with their therapist or another practitioner to try to help figure out how to make these transitions. They may need a really explicit menu of thing activities that bring them back into their body, for example. Like for many kids, it might just be helpful to remember like, oh, you might need to go to the bathroom or eat or drink water or do some push-ups after you game to like get back in your body. Um, But for kids who are really struggling, it might be helpful to have a list, you know, and like, you you know, and you're like telling them to get off the game and handing them their list and they have to like go through the checklist and this is what we do. And if it doesn't work, not as a in a punitive way, but like that game may not work for your family if every single time they play it, you know, they're going to throw the controller at someone or you know what I mean? Like, and I'll ask kids when I go out to schools, do you have friends who get too mad when they game? And how do you help a friend who gets too mad when they game? So that wouldn't be not even the transition to end it, but just like maybe struggling with losing or get just a frustration tolerance within the game. And the kids will absolutely say, yeah, I have a friend or a sibling who struggles with that. And sometimes they'll say, well, I just stopped playing the game with that friend or we just I just say, let's just go outside or do something else. Sometimes they'll say, I'll just let that friend win, but I know not to play that game with the friend. <laughs> sometimes they'll just say to the friend, hey, it's just a game you know, chill out. And so that's really interesting to see how different kids approach that with peers. But what I like about that conversation is it gives kids a chance to reflect on themselves and their own behavior as well without kind of putting it on them. I have had kids raise their hand and say, sometimes I'm the friend who gets too mad, which is like lovely and self-aware. Yeah, I think that externalizing those conversations, making them about somebody else, whether it's hypothetical or having them reflect on their relationships, It's a safer way than feeling so vulnerable when you have to just talk about your own (laughs) difficulties. When that kid raised his hand and said, sometimes I'm the friend that gets too mad. Yeah. And his friends were like, yeah, dude, you you are. At least there's some awareness (laughs) there. (laughs) Yeah. More in a minute. If you're looking for more resources on ADHD, dyslexia, and other learning and thinking differences, visit understood.org. Understood is a nonprofit dedicated to helping people who learn and think differently navigate challenges, gain confidence, 
and find a supportive community so they can thrive. Their resources are expert-driven and include a helpful range of products and tools, including articles and podcasts. You can find practical advice on topics like how to help kids with ADHD manage screen time or how to build executive function skills. Understood is trusted by educators, healthcare providers, and mental health professionals. Explore understood.org today to learn more. I know another topic that parents really consider, or hopefully are, are really starting to consider, I think when, when social media really came around originally, we just didn't really think about it a whole lot. But the fact that what we put online of our kids or what they put online of themselves is out there for public consumption. And it could be really difficult, if not impossible, to get that privacy back once it's out there. How do you help parents and kids navigating those situations? Yeah, I mean, a huge thing we can do is ask our kids permission before we post about them. And that sets them up to realize, hey, this is a boundary and I should be doing this when I post. I should be asking permission. I shouldn't just be posting. And it re reinforces that it's okay to have a boundary, which is a really positive thing. And it also gets kids asking the right questions like, dad, who's on your Instagram? Moms, who who's on your Facebook? Right. And getting them thinking a little bit about what the implications are of social media. Um, another thing we can do is make sure that they do understand that things are searchable, but we want to really focus on character over like consequences. Like we don't want to tell a sixth grader, you know, oh, you're not going to get into a fancy college because of what you just posted. We want to keep any sort of talk about reputation kind of to the moment. And we want to focus on not being misunderstood is the language that I prefer. And I think that's more positive. So instead of saying to a kid like, you're not going to get into Princeton if you post that in sixth grade. I would say, does what you posted reflect the kind of friend you want to be and the friend you want people to see you as and who you are, right? And really focus on character and not just the threat of consequences. If you do want to go to consequences, which I think is realistic, like say they're posting at school, I would talk about now consequences like hey, if you're in seventh grade and you're posting a bunch of really nasty language in a group text, somebody's mom or dad might see that and you might not get invited to that birthday party or bar mitzvah or whatever. Like they're going to have a judgment about you and they might think thoughts about you that might not feel accurate to you, but like you might be just kind of showing off for your friends, but you have to recognize that there might be this other audience there that you're not thinking about. And I think that's a more positive and helpful and also developmentally appropriate way because the fact is colleges will not see what you posted in elementary school or middle school. And even if you post something in high school, it would have to be extremely egregious. Like, yes, if you become known for having, you know, a white supremacist or homophobic YouTube channel or something like, yeah, there are going to be a lot of colleges. They're like, we don't want that kid on our campus. That person's a hater. Um, but if you're just using bad language or wearing clothes that your parents think are too sexy um, on Instagram, like, that's not going to keep you out of college. I live near Northwestern University, and I can guarantee that many kids walking around that school, which is a very hard to get into college, have probably posted language that their parents wouldn't like or worn an outfit that their parents didn't love or, you know, something like that on social media or liked even liked a post that maybe they shouldn't have. And, and so it's, I would think, more about the consequences of how people who actually know you are going to understand or misunderstand you versus like, you know, oh, these selective colleges are going to like go deep into your digital footprint and try to find your Instagram handle, even if it's not your name or whatever. They're not. If you really, really mess up and you really hurt someone, that person might send it to a college. That can happen. But it has to be pretty extreme uh, for that. Too. So I, I just think it's really important not to over focus on these external consequences and also for like, say, a sixth or seventh or eighth grader to focus on things that are five years in the future, or 10 years in the future, like getting a job. At the same time, there are teenagers that I haven't hired to babysit because of things they posted. So yeah, there are things you could post that would have an immediate consequence. I mean, I also think that as adults, we should, as much as possible, instead of feeling like we're the arbiters of shame, shame, what you did wrong, we should be teachers. So I'll give an example. A kid that I knew that had already gotten into college was a senior in high school, posted something that was like, and he was a very good student, posted that he was available for tutoring, but it kind of sounded like a paper writing service. It sounded a little bit like it veered maybe toward academic dishonesty. And I just wrote to him directly and I was like, hey, I, I know you're into college. I just want you to know, like I used to be a professor. Colleges take this stuff super seriously. I'm sure you didn't mean for it to sound this way, but it sounds a little bit like 
you're offering to write papers for kids. So I think you should maybe think about like changing the language so it's very clear that you're maybe offering an editing and proofreading service or you're offering to help them do better on research, but you're not writing the paper for them. Um, I mean, we're at a whole new level of that conversation with ChatGPT right now. But anyway, I, I and I wrote to the kid directly and I could have like passed it around to all my mom friends and been like, well, I can't believe. And I think we all need to not do that. We need to never do that. We need to not throw kids under the bus. And if we know a kid, write to them directly. I've written to friends, direct message friends where they posted about their employer or complained about something at work. And I'm like, oh, no, did you see your settings are public? You will have done that post. <laughs> complaining about your boss or, you know, teachers at work complaining about the parents who are driving them nuts. Like that shouldn't, that you could lose your job. But I, what I don't do is screenshot and amplify. And I think we all as a culture need to think about helping each other out versus ratting each other out. And the, the whole culture of kind of making examples of people, especially children, has got to end. Another really important facet of raising kids is helping them to learn how to be independent with things. And I feel like you've given some good ideas here with this, but are there some other ways that parents can help their kids be independent about managing their own devices or making good decisions about it? or trying to determine if their child has too much freedom or or when they are ready for more independence. One skill we need to teach kids is just how to use digital calendars, like in middle school or high school, and especially for kids who struggle to keep track of all their work or struggle with executive function. A digital calendar can be a godsend. I have ADHD and I really am so grateful for my digital calendar. And even though sometimes things go wrong, it's like it's I can't imagine even co-parenting without it because I think like my kid would get left places all the time. You know, we have one car and like we've learned to like, you know, put things that include the car in red. So we're not like both expecting to have the car at different, you know, at the, to go different places at the same time. So there's so many reasons why I think a digital calendar is a useful skill set. I think within reason, obviously parents ultimately need to decide, you know, and, and co-regulate you know, device use with kids. So for example, I think most kids shouldn't have a connected device in the bedroom overnight. Like that's just mm -hmm. so important for our physical and mental health. Most kids aren't ready to totally regulate, self-regulate around that. Certainly in elementary or middle school, even high school, most kids need some external support. At some point before they go to college, they may be ready to start practicing that self-regulation because in college, no one's going to take their phone away at night, right? So, um, and we know college kids stay up really late, but ultimately we want them to eventually get some sleep. And that's so, again, important for physical and mental health. And again, especially for folks with, with neurodivergence or folks who are maybe like, you know, who take meds, for example, like taking them at the same time every day is good. So if one day you're getting up at eight and the next day you're getting up at two, <laughs> it's harder to take your meds at the same time. So all these kinds of things are so important for our kids. You know, even just things, skills like navigating transit, moving through the world, knowing what to do if your phone died is important because sometimes kids will be like, well, what? how will I find my way around if, if my phone dies? And like, I'm here in Chicago where we have a grid system. And I'm like, well, you could look at the numbers on the buildings or you could, you speak the local language, you could ask someone. Um, I think our kids are rusty on talking to what I call like good strangers. And so like, you know, if your kid hasn't talked to a stranger in a while, go to the library and have them ask the librarian for help. I mean, there are times where talking to people is a good thing to do. And we want kids to practice also, you know, talking to their pediatrician, talking to people who can help them with things and self-advocating. Because I think if kids are only texting, for example, and never making a phone call or talking in person, they're missing important practice that they're going to need in the real world. And if you if you know your child is anxious about doing that, I would nudge them into some practice where they kind of have to do it. Because you don't want the first time they're making a call to be when, you know, you're off the health insurance and they're like 18 or up and trying to navigate a doctor call and they've never made a call before or they're getting offered a job on the phone and they've never answered a call. Like you're mentioning, I have clients at the office who I work with who are at that age where they're trying to find their first jobs. And the idea of having to answer a phone call and talk to somebody that they don't know <laughs> is really scary for them. Yep. And I can understand it, but also like, okay, we got to get through it one way or the other if you if you want a job. Yeah. So kids are definitely always trying to manage friendships. I mean, technology is their primary way of connecting with their peers, whether it's through a video game that they're playing online together, or if they're texting or, you know, social media, whatever that might be. One of the things that a lot of kids are dealing with is feeling left out. And sometimes it's that fear of it, whether they really are missing out or not, or sometimes they really are being excluded. And so I wanted to do top three tips that you have for parents to help their kids if they're dealing with that type of situation where they're feeling like they're they're getting left out or fearing um, that they're missing something. Okay. What is your number three tip for helping kids who feel like they're missing out? 
So number three tip is put away the phone, right? And like, say your kid is watching a sleepover or watching other kids do stuff and they're being, Mm -hmm. you know, feeling left out. It's a great time to take a break. And that's a big one, I think, because everyone posts everything on social media. And so then they see what everyone else is doing. And if they didn't get invited, that can be really hard for kids. Agree. It's hard for adults. (laughs) Yes, it is. That is so true. All right. What's tip number two? Tip number two is embrace being the B plan when your kids are teenagers. Yeah. And in most relationships, that wouldn't be healthy. Like you want to be people's A plan, whether they're your friend, your spouse, your siblings, right? But with teenagers, if they really wanted to hang out with someone they have a crush on or they're good friends and the friends are doing something else uh, or they're in between friend groups, that's a great time to embrace being the B plan. So I would watch the show on Netflix or Hulu that they want to watch and just drop everything and really hang out with them in a very low demand way, just like be there for them. And being the B plan on a Saturday night when your kid hasn't been invited somewhere else is a really gracious thing to do without making a big deal out of it. And I would also encourage them again to put the phone away and not look at what other folks are doing. All right. Your number one tip for parents helping their kids deal with this. I guess my number one tip is to embrace that it's an ordinary experience and to let them know that you've had that experience too. And we want to really normalize that. Now, we, don't, we do want to teach kids that we don't want to go out of our way to post and let, make other people feel left out. And obviously, if you're doing something with two out of your three close friends, for whatever reason, you may not want to like constantly post that and send it to the third person or whatever. Or like I was just explaining to another kid that I know, um, if you invite one kid from the lunch table, it's one thing. If you invite everybody but one, that's another thing. And maybe you don't post that because that's a little hurtful. But the reality is we're all going to see things where we were left out. So I think another thing we want to do is prepare kids for that and have a plan, like let them have a plan. So kids I've talked to have a plan where I'm going to watch my favorite show if that happens, or I'm going to invite other friends over if that happens. And I think those are really healthy things to to know that it's an ordinary experience. And so we don't want to catastrophize it for our kids. So as we wrap up, I have one last question for you. Okay. If you had to give some words of encouragement or wisdom to a parent who's just really feeling overwhelmed and frustrated by the entire process of managing technology and and helping their child navigate this world, what would you want them to hear? What, What advice would you want to share? I would just stay curious about what your child is getting out of the specific media experiences and tech experiences they're choosing. You know, is it stress release from anxiety? Is it entertainment? Is it connection with friends? Is it a different peer group than they have access to at school? And that doesn't mean that they need 24-7 access to that or that all of it is great, but really try to understand not what you see, but what they're at. You know, what are they getting out of like watching other people game or TikTok videos, you know, and maybe they'll be able to articulate that or maybe not. You may need to kind of observe. It depends how good your kid is at sort of reporting their own experience. But that can be really helpful even in thinking about what can I do then to help them regulate, help help us have stronger relationships, is if you really understand what, what the attraction is for them. Devorah Heitner, author of Growing Up in Public, which is available for pre-order. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It was my pleasure. I don't know about you, but I'm not a person for favorites. I don't have a favorite color because there are too many variables to consider. Are we talking about clothing, decor, art projects? The same with most movies, books, or food. What mood am I in? And what else have I been watching, reading, or eating lately? Favorites seem so relative, and I tend to live in the gray areas. But I'm ready to make a bold statement and tell you my favorite television show. It's The Good Place with Kristen Bell. Now, I'm not going to give any spoilers in case you haven't seen it, But one of the basic premises of the show is that it's hard in today's world to be a good person. Life is complicated and it's messy and it is impossible to be perfect. I feel like that's where parenting is, especially when it comes to making decisions about guiding your child in the digital world. I feel like it wasn't so hard for our parents. I mean, I remember when we first had cable, it was like 13 total channels. I'm a relatively tech savvy person, And I often feel confounded trying to navigate parenting decisions about what is okay and what isn't for our kids to use and access online. I guess that gray area that I live in so much of the time lends itself well to this type of situation. I rarely see technology as all good or all bad. And my husband and I try to use nuance when determining what boundaries are best for our kids. But 
I'm really glad there are people out there like Devora who can help us navigate all those ins and outs with our kids. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Today and not tomorrow, there's no time to borrow. Today, well, something's got to give today. It's a good day to live. This episode is sponsored by Understood. Visit u.org for expert resources on ADHD, dyslexia, and other learning and thinking differences. Thank you, Devorah Heitner, for an enlightening conversation. We have links to her work on the episode page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. And parents, don't forget to click the link to learn more about our new offering in cooperation with Dr. Ellie Leibowitz at the Yale Child Study Center. It's called Space, and the link is in the show notes. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our office manager and production assistant is Krista Brown. I'm the executive producer, Dave Morris. And for everyone here, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Today and not tomorrow, there's no time to borrow today. Well, something's got to give today. It's a good day to live. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.